Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joe Carbonetta, and this is Arroyo Live. Our program began as a dialogue to help restore a sense of connection within our community during a time of social separation, brought about by a global pandemic. Times change, however, and so too must the scope of our program. We will still be discussing issues related to the pandemic, but a series of recent events has once again called our nation's attention to much greater issues of separation, separations of opportunity and separations of justice. As always, our program is live. And if you are watching on Tuesday, June 9th, you can submit your questions and comments in real time to Arroyo Live at PasadenaMedia.org. That's Arroyo Live at PasadenaMedia.org. This evening, we thoughtfully examine the tragic events involving George Floyd and the movement that has followed. Joining us are Mr. Alan Edson, president of the NAACP Pasadena chapter, Mr. James Farr, journalist and host of Conversation Live, and Mr. Martin Gordon. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And if each of you would please take a moment to tell our viewers a little bit about yourselves, uh, Alan, we'll begin with you. Uh, good evening. My name is Alan Edson. I'm the president of the Passionate Branch of the NAACP. I was born and raised here in Pasadena, uh, seeing things change quite a bit and um, looking for a bright future. I think change is going to come. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Farr. Yeah, good evening, uh, Joe. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, as you know, I'm a journalist, husband, father, and um, really heartbroken right now by where we are as a country. And so hopefully we could provide some dialogue today um, that will help uh, our community better understand. All right. And lastly, Mr. Gordon. Yeah, um, I'm Martin Gordon. I'm the chair of the Pasadena Community Coalition. Um, I'm not originally from Pasadena. Uh, I, but I have been in Pasadena. I come from Columbus, Ohio, but I've been in Pasadena for over 50 years. So I've seen the changes in Pasadena that go way back from when my, uh, my uncle opened the first black barbershop and beauty salon in Pasadena. So we've seen a lot of changes and we're not seeing something new here. We're just seeing something that has transformed from the 60s back to what's happening today with all the communication we have, boy, is it a big difference of how we deal with it. All right. Well, I know you have some very, very uh, poignant insights to share with us this evening. So thank you again, gentlemen, all for joining us. Uh, and, and as I did mention in the opening, we do hope to include uh, the, the recent pandemic and all that that entails in this evening's conversation. But to start things off, I was wondering if each of you would not mind taking a moment or two to please reflect and comment on the protests over the last few weeks. Um, I guess, uh, James, how about if we begin with you there? Sure. What, what I've seen is uh, a community uh, coming together and uh, really kind of what I would call a Popeye moment. You know, it's like enough is enough. And. You know, I've taken all I can take and, and I just can't stand anymore. And to see the brutality of what happened to uh, uh, George Floyd, um, it's just heartbreaking. And, you know, we see members of the community, black, white, green and, and, and every color in between really letting their voices be heard. Pasadena has been fortunate that uh, we have not had any incidents of violence, any incidents of uh, rioting or looting. And so I think we, again, are, are, are showing ourselves to be a model city and a model community, but we're not immune to these problems. We have some issues right here in our uh, community within our police department that we cannot just gloss over. All right. Um, Mr. Gordon. Well, you know, I don't see a, a major difference from what's happening today as to what was happening when I was a young man. Um, the difference is that we have better technology, we have uh, better communication, and we have somewhat the same culturally diverse group of people coming together. Uh, in this day and age, it's a little different. Uh, we haven't seen that, especially on uh, issues of police brutality and uh, um, the effects that the police 
and other economic uh, economic uh, um, conditions have on on African Americans. So that's you know that that's something that's not new but different. The other thing is that uh, I take this very very personal. See, unlike others, I've been working on police brutality for over fifty years, uh, and in fact, and it personally affects me as I in nineteen ninety three. My cousin was killed by the police. Uh, his case was handled by uh, Johnny Cochran. And uh, I won't even tell you the amount of money that the settlement came in. But guess what? My cousin is gone. That's another one of my cousins. My cousin is gone. He's dead. So I feel the pain of the parents and the family and the community once again. Uh, and so this hasn't, this hasn't changed for me. It's just deepened my um, commitment to make sure that my cousin, uh, Michael Bryan, didn't die in vain, and that we now have um, <clears throat> Mr. Floyd, who has not died in vain. All right, Alan, um, your thoughts? Well, you know, for me, um, the protests have been interesting to observe. Um, I think, you know, they show something different than what's happened in the past. In that now, from my perspective, everything in America has failed. And, you know, people don't have anything to lose anymore. Uh, you know, every institution, every form of leadership that we have in this country has failed the people. And I think one of the interesting things now is that uh, it's failing white people. And I think, I think you see that frustration in white people as well. Uh, last Tuesday, uh, our branch, along with Indelon, uh, organized a car caravan vigil from First AME Church in Pasadena to City Hall. Uh, so you heard a lot of perspectives during that uh, event. And uh, again, I think people are just tired of everything that's going on here in America. And Pasadena is not immune to that. No, I imagine that uh, no city uh, anywhere in the U.S. Uh, is totally immune. Um, James, you mentioned something in your response that I wanted to go back to for a moment. You, uh, you brought up the fact that there has not been, uh, any notable incidences of violence within the Pasadena area, uh, during all this protest. But I wonder, are the acts of violence, is, is the rioting and looting really, uh, part of the protest movement or is it a separate movement of people taking advantage of the situation. And certainly we saw uh, similar types of civil unrest uh, almost 30 years ago with the, the, uh, the not guilty or the acquittal verdicts in the, the Rodney King beatings. Uh, and there was a lot of, of, of rioting that took place in the aftermath of that. But again, is this, is this actually part of the protest or, or is this uh, someone just taking advantage of a situation? Well, I think I think what it is, uh, Joe, is and I'll answer like the police would answer you or, or, or police apologists will answer you. It's a few bad apples. That, that's all. I mean, by and large, people are expressing themselves, they're expressing how they feel. Um, there are people that are taking uh, liberty and opportunity um, to to riot and, and enact violence. But. You have to really understand where that is centered from, you know what I mean, especially for a disenfranchised population when we're dealing with an American system that has oppressed so many people. Um, I can't tell people how to react. I choose a different path, but I don't condemn those who are out there doing what they're doing because that's what they've chosen to do. Well, and, and let I, me chime, I let me chime in on this for a second. Oh, please do, please if, do. If I can, Joe, is um, first of all, I, I hate the word riot. I hate the word riot. The people love to say riot. We don't have riots. We have uprisings. We have uprisings. This is not about a riot. That riot means that you're just going crazy for no reason. An uprising means that you have actually sure. been aggravated. You have been, you know, you, you annihilated. You, you know, you have been dis dis abused, uh, and then. You start to feel that you must rise up and do something to protect yourself, to protect your community. So I want to go back to uprising. This thing about violence. There's a couple of things here that, that, um, that concern me. 
Uh, I know a lot of people go like, oh, what's with all the violence? You're tearing up your own communities and you're doing this and you're doing that. And, and, and uh, uh, I'm not condoning violence. But I want to say this. Um, the same people that are so worried about the violence and so worried about the property are the same people that have no concern for the man that just died. Right. Um, same yeah. people that don't care about Black Lives Matter. The people that don't care about uh, African-Americans, Latinos, and people of color who are getting killed. So it's, they, they divide us by saying, come on, let's make it more important that, that there's property than there is uh, um, the killing of a human being. Uh, and when, when, you, when you step back from, from that for a minute, um, it, you, you really understand that. Um, I'm trying to think there was another point I wanted to make about that. Um, oh, it'll come back to me. I got so excited. I, 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 I don't know what to say, uh, but it'll come back to me. Um, well, well, Martin, I mean, the, the economy, people are interested in opening up. That, that is what we're hearing, right? We got to open up. People got to go back to work. Got to go back to work. And, you know, I think in our city, our city leadership has failed us with addressing police issues. Oh, oh definitely, definitely. And um, they're going to continue to fail us because we haven't had the power to move our agenda forward. The same agenda. You know what? I have a 10 point platform and program. I have a 10, uh, a 15 uh, a list of things that need to be done, you know, for the police in terms of oversight, et cetera. I had the same list 50 years ago. I had it 40 years ago. I had it 30 years ago. And since that time, I think maybe one tenth of, a, of that has even been approached and long done. So we have the critical force now to make that move forward. And if we don't utilize that, uh, that's on us. And the other thing that uh, people keep telling me is this, and say, well, we can't fight City Hall, we can't do this, we can't do that. We have to ask for what we want for two reasons. One is what is legal today is not gonna be legal tomorrow. And somebody said, well, the law doesn't allow that. Well, the law allowed Jim Crow. Jim Crow was legal. Segregation was legal. We challenged that, so now we gotta challenge this, and we've gotta change the mindset, we've gotta change the laws, we gotta change the people, and we gotta change the politics. And part of that is we gotta decide who is in our favor and who we're gonna vote for. It's interesting that you bring that uh, into the discussion about voting. Uh, I was curious for to ask everyone here on the panel their thoughts about uh, the president's recent actions involving protesters, uh, in, you know, in the area of the White House and his use of military uh, tactics to disperse that crowd simply apparently for a photo opportunity in front of a church. <laughs> it was a sad sight to see. Uh, you know, again, I mean, it just is another example of the failure of our leadership. Uh, you know, to use those extremes uh, is really that, uh, you know, he, you know, things are out of control. And, you know, uh, you know, people are tired of this government. Um, you know, the frustration has just, you know, bubbled up and bubbled over. And, you know, when you're talking about the, the rioting and the looting, uh, again, I think that's an example of people's uh, frustration with leadership and government. But, you know, so who tells a story? You know, if you went back in time and told the story of the Boston Tea Party, you know, you'd be talking about the same thing you see today. And so, it, you know, you, the media controls the narrative. And, you know, again, the same, the same thing people are, are, are fighting for right now. You know, they're, they're fighting to be treated fairly, have equal opportunity, and be able to exist as human beings. I'm going to tell you something that was interesting. I saw this in a video the other day, and I think this, rather than me uh, talk about it in any great detail, I'll tell you what this young lady said. There was a video, and it was a video of uh, 45 uh, with a little African-American girl standing there. Now, maybe some of you saw this. And 45 went over to her, and he says, come on, take a picture with me. Take a picture with me. Have you seen this, Alan? He, says, take a picture. he said, take a picture with me. Take a picture with me. And I said, what's this little girl going to do? And she was on a little cell phone. There's a bunch of people. I don't know where this happened. And she turned around and said, you know, um, uh, I'm not going to take no picture with you. You are an embarrassment to the world. <laughs> and the place fell out laughing. I mean, they fell out laughing. And then he tried to get her again. He said, no, come on, come on. She said, get away from me. Um, 
That's what's happening. The people are getting away from him. The people know that he's an embarrassment to the world. He's an embarrassment to the country. And so I have no respect for someone who would turn around right in Washington, D.C., right in the middle of a, a peaceful protest, have a hawk helicopter come down. This is illegal. This is illegal. Some of the things he's doing, and they talk about the, the army. He's going to bring the army out. If you're going to bring the army out, what do you want? Do you want civil war? Do you want a war? So he exacerbates the, the problem. So I call him 45 because he doesn't have uh, um, the right to, for, for his name to be used in my presence. Look, I, I have I have an issue with people conflating uh, 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 the murder of, of, of our dear brother, George Floyd, as well as the many other uh, loss of lives by police use of force and violence and just flat out murder. Right. With one administration. I'm not a Trump supporter, so let me qualify that. But people have been killed. Black men have been killed in this nation, in this state, and in this city. And I don't see the same outrage. And it's happened under one mayor, another mayor, uh, one president, another president. So I really think while it's all fine that we're having this national conversation, I'm excited about it. It, 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 it makes me feel good. The issues before us are right here at home. Tomorrow, our, our, our public safety committee will be discussing, uh, uh, you know, possibly agendizing uh, some form of police oversight. And I think that's a great start. Some thought that there was never an appetite for it, but now we see that it is on the table. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, two of our mayoral candidates, and I wrote about this uh, just yesterday in the Pasadena Black Pages, Alan, at, at the demonstration on City Hall. They didn't say anything. They talked every way around the issue of why we're here, and no one held them to account. And so it's great to have this national conversation, but right now, I'm not facing military troops on Pennsylvania. I may have to have contact with our local law enforcement. And that's where the conversation needs to start, continue until we're done having it, until we have some sort of reform. Well, look, let me ask you, gentlemen, this no, question. No, no, um, let, me, let, me, let me step in because I got to tell James something that I like so much. Okay. I like so much because uh, we have two mayoral, mayoral can candidates who are stepping back and kind of waffling around. That's, that, that stuff is over, brother. Is over. You either step up, step forward, and be with the people, or step back, get back, because you're not getting my vote. And I'm telling you, if neither one of you can do that, then guess what? We need to decide, do we need to elect someone and then put them out of office? Look here, we can, we've got all kinds of avenues. I am sick of this. Stand up, be a man, and if you don't want to do what's right, tell me. Get out. If you can... Well then, then move forward, but make it, don't just say you're going to do it. You have got to do it. And you can't tell me, I looked up community oversight again. I saw where they were going to go tomorrow and look at all the community oversight again. I don't give a dang. You're going to say the same thing you said before. I need for you to bring something forward. You need to bring a community task forward in, your, in, in there with you to look at this and say, we make some recommendations. We are the people. I want the NACP to nominate somebody to be in there. I want you to nominate somebody to be in there to make sure that they start to move towards movement to actually have oversight. If they're going to hash over it again and get on stage, <laughs> guess what? Boy, please don't make me say some bad words. I'm done. Well, gentlemen, locally, <laughs> there has been discussion of recent uh, about removing a large chunk of the budget from the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, across the nation, there have been discussions about reducing funding to the police. Uh, I, Minneapolis has even gone so far as to feel the idea of disbanding their police department entirely uh, in favor of some type of, of community uh, uh, service or, or community protection. Uh, do, you, do you gentlemen think that that's a good place to start? Is it a good idea at all? Are there better ways that we can address these issues? Well, Joe, um, during our vigil, that was one of my... Uh, is that they freeze the police budget and don't increase it to $91 million. As you look at our police department, man, we're looking at the military, uh, plain and simple. Uh, you know, they're spying on us as citizens. 
Uh, they've got, uh, you know, heavy artillery. And, uh, you know, we as people, you know, to need to, to sit back and, and determine, you know, what kind of country do we want? What kind of city do we want? And, you know, nobody talks about, you know, what kind of morality are we demanding? What kind of ethics are we demanding? And, and again, you know, we're just uh, perpetuating business as usual. And in my view, uh, everything that happened before March 1st, 2020 is null and void. You know, we have the opportunity to craft and develop a brand new system of life. And our voices need to come to the table and be heard. And if I got a voice for somebody to be on a con commission, I vote for Martin. <laughs> don't, you, don't you go there. Don't you go there. I'm too old for anything these days. Well, well, look, next next Thursday, I'm going to sit down with both uh, Mayor Tornick and Victor Gordo, Council Member Victor Gordo, uh, in a virtual town hall. And we're going to unpack, because I really want to know where they stand on these issues. Both have agreed to appear on the conversation live. Uh, as more details come available, I'll share that with the audience. But like I said, they said nothing. Absolutely nothing in front of a crowd of 35, what was it, 3,500 people, Alan? Wow. And, 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 3,500 yeah. people. Yeah. And again, you know, I mean, it's, you know, what do people want? And, you know, we should be tired of the type of leadership that we've been faced with. You know, for me, you know, police, police reform happens, the police put down their guns. And if we're not talking about that, you know, we're just, you know, running our mouths. You know, that's what's going to create a better, a better, safer and, and better city. Well, let's get back to the police budget for a minute, because I want to say a little bit about that. Uh, when we say defund the police, I, I, I'm not sure what it is in Pasadena right now. You know, in L.A., I think it's 53 percent of the budget. Um, and they're always saying they need more police. They need more this. They need more that. Well, um, uh, first, let me look back at, at some of the stuff that's coming out of the general fund. Um, that, that's my taxpayers dollar. So in the last five years. I believe that $2.5 million was paid for settlements for police misconduct. Uh, I believe that uh, those, pol those police officers uh, are still on the force. That's ridiculous. Um, I bet you, and as a defunding, I bet you if every time there was a civil settlement that that million dollars had to come out of police budget, you might start seeing some changes in, in the dynamic of how they train th their police officers. But in the meantime, we need to defund some of those just as, as the city is doing in, in L.A. Or, or talking about and putting some of those money back into the community. Because the real thing is that if we had um, better uh, education services, better housing, better jobs, a lot of these a lot of these issues wouldn't even have uh, 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 would come about, although we must change this, uh, uh, the, the Gestapo police force in our communities. My, my goal is let's, uh, let's not let the police occupy our communities. If they can't serve, get out. There has been discussion, uh, not necessarily by the media, but certainly uh, discussions that have, have been uh, um, shown in the media that, that there are experts who have referred to a culture of racism within law enforcement. Uh, I'm curious to know your gentleman, your gentleman's take on that. Do, do you believe that there is a culture or are we dealing with the quote unquote few bad apples? Do you want me to take this one? Or you better not. <laughs> I, 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 I openly, I invite everybody on the panel to, to, uh, to have an opinion on this. Please don't make me I'll, I'll say that there is a culture. You can go, you can take it from there, Martin. Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a culture. There, there is a culture of racism. And, and unfortunately, uh, you know how we always talk about that 99 percent of the, uh, the police officers are great, that, that they're good, et cetera. And, and I believe that there's a good majority of police officers that really want to do their job well. But the culture of racism is uh, catching, just like COVID-19. And so if everybody around you is doing something, if everybody has that that mentality, that we can beat, we, we, we can beat black people, uh, you know, uh, anytime we want to. I even see an African-American cop come in and start beating somebody. And he had to turn and look at himself and say, what the hell am I doing? The culture of racism seeped into him. 
So yeah, there's a big culture. And so even the people who understand and, and, and want to move forward, we've got to change that culture. And part of changing that culture means that there has to be consequences, not just accountability, but consequences. If you do this, you are going to be put off the force. If you do this, you're going to be fired. If you do this, you're not going to get paid. If you want to get paid, let the big, powerful police union pay you while we wait to see whether you're going to be charged or not. And then if you're not and you did the right thing, then the city will pay you back then. In the meantime, it's, let's, let's move some of that responsibility away from the taxpayer and, and put it on the people who have millions and millions of dollars to spend to say, uh, guess what? Uh, um, <clears throat> we don't want police uh, to have their own set of rules. So, yeah, there's a big culture. James, I'm, I'm curious to know your, your opinion on this as well. I mean, when you, look at the, uh, the, when you look at the cover officer in the George Floyd incident, the Asian officer who casually stood by and observed, I mean, his job, number one, was to, for crowd control and security purposes, to watch the officer six, right? Watch their backs while they murdered him. But he took a front row seat. I mean, he sat courtside, and I, I, I hate to trivialize it like that, but part of the culture that what those, let's just say the one officer, because we now know the other two were relatively new. And in fact, one was on his third shift. So he's learning the culture, right? He's being indoctrinated. FTOs are the lifeline for rookies, for boots. And there's no measurement for though each FTO is different. So had this not been recorded, it's likely that that officer would have accepted that as a part of the culture. And not only become complicit, he would have continued to do it. So, yes, there is a culture. Are they all bad? No, I don't think so. Um, did that guy wake up that day thinking he was going to kill somebody? I don't know. But I don't know how to see it any other way than a sadistic black trauma porn. You know what I mean? We're just watching a man's life get snuffed out in front of a camera, in front of his own community for the world to see. And people are upset that people are screaming black lives matter. It's just, it's, 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 it's beyond me. But the culture of racism, Joe, uh, I, I want to back up for a second. The culture of racism is there, but then there are racists that are on the police department. And so that means when you have a culture of racism, it, what made me think of this is when James said he didn't wake up in the morning and think that I'm going to kill a black man. But he did wake up in the morning and say, if it's a black man, um, um, I can do whatever I want because sure. that's feel about black people. And those are just racist. And I'm not saying every cop is racist. I'm saying with the racist culture, those kind of cops got to be weeded, weeded out very quickly. The system that they work for is racist, yeah. period, point blank, period. Well, I've lost a friend, a longtime friend, former law enforcement, uh, because she felt I was attacking her and saying that she is a bad person. And I'm like, no. It's it's we often hear officers say, you know, not on my watch. You know, I, I don't put up with that foolishness. But how many of them actually turn somebody in? I'll wait. Very rarely does it happen. All they're concerned about is how they can write the report that doesn't get their ass in trouble. That's that's what happens. That's that, you know, blue wall of silence or whatever. It's I'm going to cover my butt. When we write this report, if you lie, but I'll swear to it, that's, I mean, we see it all the time right here in Pasadena. Our office body worn camera footage before they write a report. If either of us were a witness to a bank robbery and the police wanted to interview us, they're not going to let us watch the, the, the tape and then give our first person account of what happened. They're going to ask you the same question four or five times. He was black. No, you said he was white. It's going to be over until they can get a consistent story. We have to change the way officers are allowed to police. And 
we, you know, I, I think our issues need to be taken to Sacramento. California should consider, do we depost certify police officers? If you're in the financial industry, you commit a crime, you lose your license. If you're a doctor and you malpractice, you lose your license. If you're a lawyer, you misrepresent somebody, you, you, you lose your license. And I can go on and on in the different credentials or accredited type of uh, 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 professions. But it's only in, 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 in two states where this is possible, there, it, unless there's some serious consequences for the actions that are taken, we're going to just see officers roll to another department. But James, you, you, bring, you mentioned that, that oftentimes if an officer is found to have uh, uh, acted inappropriately, he's quietly moved to another department. Um, and, and several of you gentlemen have referred to the very powerful police unions, which leads me to my next question. Is it possible with with the unions being as well connected, as well funded and as strong as they are? Is it possible to to see change within the law enforcement community and how uh, they operate short of defunding these organizations? Wow, defunding. That's an interesting idea. Um, you know, w- one of the issues here, you, you remember back a, a long time ago when Ronald Reagan said that he was going to uh, uh, get rid of the uh, Air Traffic Controllers Union? Mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe you're, too, maybe you're too young for that. No, I, I definitely I, I, I do remember. recall that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and for all intents and purposes, that's what he did. He, he devastated it, you know? And so, um, the, the police union is one of the most powerful unions in the United States of America. Almost every state has a budget for police officers that's over 50 percent. And that that lobby for them is a, a, a multi-million dollar lobby. So to make those kind of changes, I agree with James. We not we not only have to go to Sacramento and start and start getting that, but we have to go to the federal government and say, guess what? We have to make sure that they don't have that kind of power. We have to make sure that they can no longer lobby the same people that pay their salaries, the Mm -hmm. same people that make the kind of legislation that doesn't allow us to have the rights we want. So therefore, people keep saying it's against the law. It's against the law. You can't do that. Yes, it was against the law for me to eat at a restaurant 50 years ago. We've got to change the law. We've got to change that dynamic. We've got to take on. That's that's I said it out loud. We've got to take on the police union. And we and, you know, it's been floated around. We need to break up our city attorney's office, our city attorney and our city prosecutor. (laughs) Don't get me started on legal stuff, man. Okay, because (laughs) the city attorney's job is to defend the city. So if the city attorney is also the prosecuting attorney, she's laying the foundation, he or she, for defense for the city. And so, again, we're talking about systems. And that's those, right, those things need to be broken up. And, you know, I mean, it's the systems that perpetuate the injustice that we see. Uh, you know, you're probably aware that several of us are trying to put together a uh, Bill of Rights reform for the police department. And one of the things that came up was not having the police union contribute to political candidates. Mm-hmm. Came to find out that that's unconstitutional. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's another structural thing that, you know, we come up with great ideas, but at the end of the day, we're talking about behaviors of people. And people just want to act like rotten, wild dogs. And, you know, we, there should be a point where we just don't, don't accept that anymore. Uh, our mayor, city council, city manager, they should all understand this reality of the police force. But, you know, these systems operate in every sphere of life. You know, one of the things that this virus has shown is that black people are also, you know, the, the lowest on the total pole of health care. Uh, we're also the lowest, lowest on, you know, what's our economy like? And so, you know, we're dying at every sphere of life. And, 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 you know, the police and criminal justice is one area. But, you know, every area is taking us out. And, you know, one thing that the virus has shown is that they made this distinction between essential 
and non-essential people and jobs. And what came up, man, you know, brown people, black people are the most essential to keeping this machine running. And so in reality, we can close the machine down if you believe that. And so, you know, we've got power. You know, that's how we exercise our power. And, you know, we've got, you know, different opinions about things. The thing is for us to come up with one opinion that we're taking downtown and saying, you know, we want it to see this way. You, we want to talk about police oversight. I think police oversight begins in the beginning of the hiring process. You know, cops don't get bad until they get into the culture. So we have some kind of idea in the front end uh, that uh, police know that we're watching them, that we, you know, we have a certain uh, reality we want to create here, create here in Pasadena. Then we ourselves could be able to point out somebody that might go rogue or somebody that might be a good person. But we don't, we don't get into it until like, somebody is shot, killed, uh, somebody's injured. Uh, I think at that point it's too late. I All right, think, gentlemen, I think, I, I'm I, sorry I, to interrupt I, the flow of the, of the conversation, but we do have a caller that's been waiting for some time, and we want to give her an opportunity to, to uh, give us her comments as well. Danielle, are you with us? I am. I'm here. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, what, what would you like to say? Um, you know, I joined in a, a little bit later, but I definitely have, um, I, I would love, oh, were you saying something, James? I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> okay. I wanted to, um, I wanted to say that, you know, it's very important for us to kind of um, take a step back when it comes to situations like this to make sure that uh, we are addressing the right questions with the right, correct responses. Um, a lot of times we uh, go out and we begin to uh, make assessments without first taking account. So, you know, a lot of, uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, sporadic responses. And so I would hope that, you know, we come together to have a, a real conversation about what's gonna actually uh, make change happen. So. That's my, that's my, my thoughts on that. All right. Well, Daniel, well what thank I, you. So what, I wanted, what I wanted to add, Joe, because uh, someone asked me, you know, you've talked to Chief Perez. What does he think about police oversight? And I've asked him that question, right? And I'll let him speak for himself on that. But what I think is important for us to know as a community, it doesn't matter what he th thinks or feels about it. He serves under the city manager. The city manager serves under the council members. So however the council so directs the city manager, so does the police chief have to follow. And if he doesn't, we get a new one. It's plain and simple. So we can pound all up and down Garfield at the police headquarters and ask Chief Perez, what does he think? Or how does he feel? We can ask the police association, what do they think? And how do they feel? But until we have honest conversations with our city council members, and remember, it takes five of them to ratify the city charter in order for this to actually come to fruition. And so that's where the pressure has to be applied. Our mayor doesn't have the power. You know, ceremonially, we, we, we defer to him for things. But each one of them has a one eighth interest in the city and they represent the entire city. So it may not matter to McAustin. It may not matter to Wilson. It certainly doesn't matter to Gene Masuda. Uh, and, and I know Madison kind of says that we are the oversight body. I know Gordo has said we are the oversight body. We need to hold all of them to account. And if they don't want it, then decisions have to be made. I, I, you know, you said something that's so important there about those uh, uh, people on city council who say oversight is the public safety committee. And in particular, when you mentioned uh, Victor Gordo and, and you mentioned Steve Madison, um, uh, both who I believe have taken that police money and uh, which seems to be a conflict of interest. And all well, we didn't do it this time, but go ahead. Okay, but, but they've done it before. Sure. And, and, and they've done it lots of times. And so the, my issue is, and you know, it may be illegal right now, we can change that law for, for us to say that they can't take police money, but I think we need to step forward and say, guess what? If you're taking police money in this cycle, at this time, give it back. Show us 
that you're a man, that you're with us, and you give that money back. Simple. Uh, don't have to be a law. Let's put the pressure on them and say, let's do the right thing. Show me that you are here for black lives and that they matter. All right. Um, obviously, the the death of George Floyd at the hands of police uh, was, I guess, uh, in simplest terms, the match that has lit the flames of the most recent wave of protests. But it is certainly uh, short sighted to say that that this is the only reason for the protests. As all of you gentlemen have mentioned, there there are a long list of of people of color and other races that that have had uh, uh, acts of violence committed against them by the police uh, over the years. So are you gentlemen surprised to see all of the the uh, protests, all of the, the people that are now involved this time? Does this come as a shock to anyone? Not, not me. Not me. Not at all. <laughs> Which is why I'm not I, I don't condemn those who choose one path as, as a course of action because I choose another. And so it's it, this, this isn't the, 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 the match that lit the fuse. The fuse has been burning in this country for years, Joe. This isn't nothing new. Um, you know, why people are reacting to it is probably the confluence of a lot of things. One, we have just been as a nation, as a world in a pandemic and have had the, the, the living daylight scared out of us about dying. And then when we see, and I've talked to officers, some say, hey, we're not doing any enforcement. You know, now unarmed people are weaponized with this COVID. And so for these officers to go hands on, and as we saw in New York, when 35 people were arrested and 32 of them were African-American for not social distancing, it clearly showed that as the country opened up, so did the ass weapons as well. They never stopped. And so I'm not at all surprised at all. And I dare say it's long overdue. So however we get to the point of change, I'm in the car because there's a generation coming behind us. You've scared them and told them <laughs> that they're worthless. You've told them that they're going to die. You've sent essential workers, as we have discussed, who are predominantly African-American, people of color, brown and, and the like, to work. They've dri driven the buses. They've, they've stocked the grocery shelves. I mean, they've done all of these essential things. And then a guy has an alleged $20 bill that we don't even know if he knew. We can't ask him. Was, did you know you had a fake $20 bill? He can't answer that question now. So where was his due process? That's the issue. This, this, this isn't nothing new for either of these two older gentlemen that I'm sitting here with. And if you wanted to have a one-up story, we'd be here all night talking about Man, well, they did this to me. Well, I know they did that to my daddy. I did, did this to my brother. So it's nothing new, Joe. All right. Joe, well, Joe, let me tell you something else. Because that, that, you asked a question about surprise. No, uh, all of us said we're not surprised. But I'm going to give you a real life um, um, incident that shows me the change. Maybe 20 years ago, I don't want to know how, say how long ago, but I, I was the, uh, the chair um, I, I was actually a director of a place called PATH, People Assisting the Homeless. And I did uh, their social service and legal department. And uh, I had a young white uh, um, uh, gal who worked for me. And she was about 25 at the time. And um, I used to explain to her, along with other people, about some of the things that were going on for these homeless people, which were predominantly African-Americans and blah, 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 and the police and all these different things. Last night, this is just... Just funny. Last night, she emailed me. I haven't heard from her 25, 30 years. And she said, Martin, I won't say her name, but she said, blah, blah, blah. She said, I see, oh, I'm just sickened by what I see. And I, you know, and I don't know what to say. And I thought of you. And she said, I remember all of the things that you used to say. And I would say, I don't understand, Martin. I don't understand. She said, I get it. I don't understand why I didn't see it 
before. That's why I'm not surprised. We've been educating people around, people of color, people not of color, but people in general about what's happening in this country. And I think this was a super wake up call that made some eyes that were closed open wide and say, I see it clearly and I saw it all along, but now I'm willing to do something. What you know, again, I, I think the key to this whole thing though is we can't look back. Um, you know, what happened in, you know, just a month ago, you know, all failed for us. And, and we had to create something different. And, you know, the attitudes that are pervasive in police force, also pervasive in government, also in business. And, you know, we've, you know, those aren't going to change. It's our actions that are going to change things. And, and again, you know, if we just took essential workers out of the, the, the picture, things would stop. Uh, and, and so, you know, again, we've got to value our power and, and, and utilize it. Joe, someone yeah. wants to call in. What's the number they can call in? Uh, that's that's uh, there's there's a, been some difficulty with our phone system this evening. Ah. Unfortunately, the, the best way to to uh, add comments would be through the Arroyo Live at Pasadena Media dot org website. Unfortunately, we must apologize. But uh you know, because the the covid situation is ongoing and we are still uh, working largely from home, as is obvious by the program this evening, everybody's uh, in separate locations. Um, we're using the technology that we have available to the best of our ability. Unfortunately, it doesn't always function as planned. And the phone system was one of those areas where we fell a little short this evening. So we do apologize for that. Uh, certainly, if you do have a comment, please do. Eight, 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 two. Three, one, two, three is not working. We have someone, someone from law, someone from law and for James. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we were actually having difficulty with your your feed just now. I, I didn't understand what you said, and we may have actually temporarily lost James. Uh, I think that someone from law enforcement wanted to make a comment. Yeah, someone from law enforcement wanted well, to make a comment. Yeah, uh, again, the, the best way, unfortunately, that I know of for them to contact us this evening is uh, via email with Arroyo Live at PasadenaMedia.org. And if they, if they write there, we can check that. And hopefully our producers will get us that information and we can read their comments aloud uh, during the program this evening. Although we are getting close to the end of the show, we, we're approaching about the 10-minute uh, mark, I believe. Um, you know, going back to the discussion about the protests, uh, and certainly all of you gentlemen have uh, echoed the same sentiment that you're not surprised to see the, the, the large outpouring of support uh, after these most recent incidents. Um, but my next question becomes, and actually let me preface it with saying, we've been told time and time again that change takes time, unfortunately. Um, and with that in mind, what results are the African-American communities and the other communities of color that are involved in these most recent protests? What are they looking for uh, as a result? Do you, um, do you think that they're expecting an immediate change or, or smaller increments? What, what, what are the hopes in, in the near term hopes and possibly the longer term goals for this movement? Change in law enforcement. Uh, you know, we want to see change in law enforcement. You keep hearing, you know, defunding, defunding, defunding the police departments. Uh, that'd be one step. But again, you know, we're, we're sick people. You know, our communities aren't healthy. Uh, so where's health care? Uh, you know, our communities have very few African-American businesses thriving. You know, so we're not circulating our own money. Uh, you know, so is this on, simply a police issue or are we looking at a larger issue uh, of government in general? We're looking at the, I'm looking at the whole thing. And you know, for us to improve our condition, uh, our economics has to change, our health has to get better, and we have to get engaged civically. Uh, yeah, police, you know, uh, police brutality and, and what's happening with the police is just a symptom of a larger problem, that's for sure. But in terms of the police specifically and the police department, and uh, our city council and our city manager, there are some immediate changes that we uh, will be asking for as a group that can happen immediately. They have the power to do that, and we need to see some of that 
so that we can see that they're serious about change. Some other things are going to take legislation, uh, maybe go on the ballot, uh, maybe be federal, et cetera. But there are some things that they can do right away. And so I think one of the questions here is some of the things that we ask for they ha can, that can actually be a decision can be made on and we can change immediately. We need to do that to see that we're moving in the right direction uh, or, or do we have to step up another notch to make sure these things get done? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the hope generation, you know, Reverend Jesse talked a great deal about hope and, and, and hope has, as I became a man and into adulthood, never seemed like a good strategy, it just didn't work out too well. But if I will go back to that, that, that 18 year old James, that was hopeful that the people in government had my best interests at, in, in, at hand. Uh, I have to transfer that to the adult James that says our own city government, our city leaders saw a savage beating of a 21 year old motorist in our city and did nothing, absolutely nothing. And by today's standards, likely one or both of those officers may have been arrested and charged. But now they quote are waking up and seeing things. I guess I am a little bit hopeful, but I'm not going to hold my breath. But what I would like to see is as a city, as a community, that we hold those. And I'm not talking to the folks that live in the 91103 district zip code. OK, that's not who I'm speaking to. I'm speaking about all the other districts. When my neighbors become uncomfortable with what we are dealing with as a society, I hope they hold their elected officials to account. When I know that my own city council member, Gene Masuda, has not responded to numerous emails from people, not me, I haven't said anything to him, but he hasn't responded to any emails from concerned constituents and as to where does he stand. But back to your point, Martin, when you are accepting campaign contributions, you've already told us where you stand. And it certainly isn't with the people. Amen to that. All right. Um, just um, something that uh, uh, we thought we would ask is have either have any of you gentlemen felt comfortable yourselves participating, actively participating in any of the protests that have taken place? Uh, you know, certainly COVID is still uh, of great concern. And there has been discussion about uh, a lack of social distancing uh, or other safety measures being in place at some of these events. But but have any of you gentlemen felt comfortable participating in those protests directly? I am. Uh, and I certainly have. Yeah. Responsibility audience. Uh, and matter of fact, we're going to have another one uh, June 19th. You're welcome, Joe. All right. <laughs> uh, you know, but let me say something you, about that let me, before you go further. Okay. Um, I haven't been really active. Um, I've, you know, I've been traveling some and, and doing some other things, which makes me a little concerned about me being in, um, in the crowds. You know, because after after you travel, you are supposedly, you know, supposed to. And I know that 45 doesn't do that and whatnot, but I feel a little uncomfortable. with. Uh, I've been doing a little traveling. And when I get there, people are actually saying we, we have to work. And then when I come back, I feel a little concerned about uh, especially uh, being on the ground. Uh, we had a great, great thing that uh, the NACP did. Um, uh, with I forgot the name of the other organization where we where people got in their cars, which I felt totally happy about. But after a while, some people start getting out of their cars. <laughs> I went like, oh my goodness, you know. I said, I'm in that age group that says if uh, um, maybe that young man's uh, asymptomatic, but he could give it to me. So I have to tell you because I have had uh, three deaths uh, from COVID nineteen, uh, one in my family. And two of my friends uh, in New York, and one was as young as four. The young lady was 45 years old. I guess I'm a little more nervous than uh, the rest of you. But I get, I'll tell you this. I mean, I've done my, my uh, uh, protesting uh, of 50 years ago, and I'll be dang if I won't get out there in the best way I can and protest now. Uh, Joe, yes. Af African-Americans, specifically black men, have been mitigating and social distancing since we landed on the shores of this country. And so it's not a new idea for us to mitigate 
our contact with police and also to practice social distancing. And so I, I attended all three of the larger uh, uh, demonstrations uh, last week at City Hall and the police. I spoke at one. And so in terms of being concerned, sure, I'm concerned, you know, I, I'm, but but I'm more concerned about my travel there and back than I am once I get in with people. You know what I mean? Because my issues or the threats on my life, potential threats on my life. I'm not worried about a protester. <laughs> well, I can certainly understand that. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we only have a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to, everybody to have an opportunity to, to give any closing thoughts. So uh, if we can start uh, with, with Alan, um, we really only have about a minute each. You know, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be on. Uh, I hope people heard what we had to share. And, uh, you know, it's really for us to take action. Uh, you know, if we're smart, keen and been observant over our lifetimes, we should realize, man, things that we did before didn't work. And we got to come anew. Uh, and so that's what I really want to leave people with. Thank you for that. Uh, Martin, uh, your thoughts very quickly. Um, I, I'll just say one thing, and it's something that James say, said. Um, I've been social distancing from the police for my whole life. So uh, I really know how to social distance. And I'm going to continue that social distancing because I don't want to be the next George Floyd. And that can happen to anybody, including my son. All right. And, and uh, James, also for you very quickly, I'm afraid. Real simple. FTP. FTP. You guys can fill in the blanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's why, it's, you always have to get, why you always got to get crazy? <laughs> well, and and you use some bad no, words, too. I'm going to get you. It, no, I, no, I said fight the power. Uh, somebody, some of y'all minds went somewhere else with that, and I won't take you off of that. But in, in, in all seriousness, uh, Joe, Martin, and, 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 and Alan, I really want the, uh, the police department and our city leadership to live up to what is actually inscribed on the front doorsteps of the police department, which is the Pasadena way. And they say, these aren't my words, we are firm, we are proactive, we exist to serve the community. How we get the job done is as important as getting the job done. All People right. in this um, community want I, justice. I'm sorry to, to, to cut this short, but we're out of time. Mr. Alan Edson, Mr. James Farr, and Mr. Martin Gordon, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, Great to see you, Black men. If there are topics you'd like to see addressed on our discussions, you can email them to us at arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org, and we may include them in a future broadcast. Thank you for watching Arroyo Live. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me, Joe. Thanks, guys. <laughs>